Well, good afternoon and welcome. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Chris. I'm the lead pastor here at Hoboken Grace. And today as we come together, we are actually in the midst of a conversation called Starting Point. If you haven't been with us for the past few weeks, I would highly encourage you to go back and to listen to these conversations because for about four weeks now, we've been looking at, okay, how would you restart your faith as an adult? And looking at what the original starting point of faith was, for those that launched the church, for those who actually knew Jesus. And we've been looking at all these different starting points, the starting point of our faith journey, the starting point of faith itself, our starting point, where we're coming from. And over the past couple of weeks, we've, we've seen some really exciting things as we've seen how God consistently over and over again steps into our life and says, no, no, the relationship that you have with me, the future that you have with me is not based on what it is that you do. It's based on trust. I don't need you to fix the mess. I just need you to trust me. God, what is it that makes our relationship possible? As you look at him and the nation of Israel, it's that you trusted me. And I think for a lot of us, it, we've walked out of the last couple of weeks and there's been an incredible excitement about, okay, this is the future and this is a relationship that we get to have with him. But but if we're going to have an authentic starting point, and if we're going to be honest about this journey of faith, we can't just talk about the future. We also have to talk about the past. And to look at and work through something that we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we looked at the reality that we're, we're not just the mistaker, but that sometimes we make mistakes on purpose. This reality that we're a sinner. If we're going to have an authentic starting point, we can't just look forward. The reality is, is that we have to look backward and ask this question, well, what do we do with that sin? And we talked as we work through that conversation about how Jesus, as he engages the conversation of sin in our life, he does so not for the purpose of condemnation, but for the purpose of reconciliation, for the restoration of that relationship. But, but it's still there. What, what do we do with that? And I think for many of us, as we were growing up, we were taught different things as far as how we should engage our sin or how we should engage God about our sin. And so maybe you were taught that you needed to ask God to forgive you when you sinned or maybe you were taught that you needed to talk to a certain person or, or that you needed to go to a certain place in order for you to be forgiven. And when you're younger, that seemed to be okay because, I mean, let's be honest, the, the sins weren't all that significant. You were selfish with your toy. Or are you, maybe you went into your, your sibling's room when you weren't supposed to. It, but, then, but then as we grow up, the, well, the sins get bigger. And more significant. And there's that weekend that you don't want to think about again, or that time you went to a Taylor Swift concert. <laughs> I, love, I love giving Taylor Swift fans a hard time because they get so angry. It's unbelievable how angry they get. I will get more emails about that comment than anything else I've said in the last month, guaranteed. Guaranteed, they get so upset about the fact that I pick on Taylor Swift. It's, like, it, it's unbelievable, but, but but it's, it's true, isn't it? You, when, it? when you're younger, that seems okay, but then you, you grow up and, and things, well, things get a lot more significant. And there are whole sections of your life that you don't talk about anymore. And no one even knows that you were married before. People ask you about your college experience, and your answer is just, I went. I went, I did, yeah, 
Well, what? No, we don't talk about that. And it's amazing. All it takes is just a single word or maybe a picture. And all of it comes flooding back. And you try not to think about it and you try not to talk about it. And you won't you won't even talk to your doctor about the abortions. And you try to act like it just didn't it just didn't happen. And you would give anything to go back and change that moment. You'd give anything to go back and take those words back. If you could just take those words back. At some point, if we're going to be honest on this faith journey, we have to answer this question. What can wash away my sin. I understand, I understand the future, but, but what about the past? And it's unbelievable how powerful guilt can be and the shame that can follow us around like a, almost like a shadow. And you manage to avoid it most of the time, but then in those quiet moments of life, all of a sudden it comes back and your pit in the, stu- the pit in your stomach is just like that moment was happening again. What do you do with that? I think as we walk through this, it's crucial that, that we be honest about this conversation. And there are a lot of different ways that we try to move past it and we tell ourselves, well, I mean, I was, I'm just human and, and, and we hope that that will make it go away or, or we, we tell ourselves that, listen, I was young or, or I was drunk or I, I was just incredibly lonely. You, you don't understand what was going on at that point in my, in my life. And we hope that that will make it go away. But it doesn't. Because just as we talked about a couple weeks ago, when you understand that you're not just a mistaker, when you understand that it wasn't just a mistake that needed to be corrected, but that, no, no, you, you sinned, then you, then you have to understand that it moves from just a correction issue to a forgiveness issue. And you realize that you owe for what happened. It's not just that you owe someone else. You owe yourself. I'm better than that. I should have been a better dad. I'm better than that. I I should have been a better friend. A better son. And you realize that you owe, but what do you do when you owe? And for many of us, we've lived our whole life trying to make up for those moments. And you live the way that you live and you work the way that you work and you, because of the fact that you're trying in some way to make up for or to pay for what it is that happened, but no amount of future actually erases the past. And you give to the things that you give to, the money that you give, hoping that somehow it will outweigh what happened. What can wash away? my sin. For some of you, you drink the way that you drink. 
hoping that you won't have to remember it. What can wash away my sin? It's a question that all of us ask, every single one of us. And all of us live our lives trying to figure out. That's why every faith tradition in the world tries to answer that question. Because all of us have those shadows. All of us have those clouds. And we're trying to figure out, is there anything that can make it go away? And every faith tradition comes in and says, okay, well, this is how you make it go away. This, this is how you make it better. And there's all sorts of different answers to this. And so you need to go to this certain place or you, you, you need to show up at church a certain number of times. Some of you, that's why you're, you're here today. You're hoping that if you come enough times that hopefully, just hopefully, it will actually go away. Hopefully, just hopefully, it will get better. You can forget Or maybe it's certain prayers that you have to pray. Every single faith tradition has an answer to this question. But there's one that actually, there's one that actually sets itself apart. Because it's, it's a drastically different solution. Every faith tradition has a solution. But there's only one faith tradition in which that solution is a person. And so there are many prophets or so-called prophets who've come before us and said, well, this is the system and this is the system and this is the system. But there's only one who stepped on the scene and actually offered himself as the solution. There are many. Every faith tradition offers a solution. But only one person ever offered himself as the solution. Many, Many of you may not have recognize this before, but this is one of the things that significantly sets Jesus apart because as Jesus steps on the scene, he doesn't step on the scene and say, okay, this is the system to solve it. He doesn't step on the scene and say, okay, these are the things that you need to do to absolve yourself of what happened in the past, to finally be able to leave that behind, to finally be able to move past the past. No, he actually steps on the scene and says, there is no no system that's a solution. I'm actually the solution. Which, by the way, if you hear someone say that, there's only three possibilities. Either one, he's a phenomenal liar. Or number two, number two, he's lost his mind. He has no idea what it is that he's saying. Or number three, or number three, there's something to it. It has to be one of those three things And the reality is is that when Jesus steps on the scene and he begins to communicate this, no one around him gets it. But from the beginning of his ministry, this is what he's communicating. As a matter of fact, even when he's introduced to the world, he's introduced this way. Uh, Let me take you there. It's actually found in the book of John. Now, John is an interesting individual because John was one of Jesus' closest friends. When Jesus is on the cross, he actually asked John to care for his mom. That's how close they were. And John was one of his disciples. But John was originally a disciple of someone else, an individual named John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was phenomenally popular. As a matter of fact, listen to what Mark says about John the Baptist. It says, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. John was incredibly popular. Now, this is, this is John the Baptist. And John the Baptist comes before Jesus. John the Baptist was so significant that he's not only mentioned, not only is he mentioned in scripture, but he's also mentioned in the Quran. And he's also mentioned by Josephus, who was the leading historian of that time because he was phenomenal what he was doing and the crowds that were gathering to him. And John's message was just simply this. Listen, you are not just a mistake or you are a sinner. You need to change direction and you need a savior. And there's one who's coming who's going to be that savior. Now, now many people thought that John was the Messiah. They thought that he was the Savior. As a matter of fact, they consistently came to him and said, okay, are you the one? Are you the one? Are you the one? Because the crowds were incredible. 
And John was doing something that no one had ever done before. Because previously, if you were outside of, if you weren't a Jew and you wanted to step into Judaism and you wanted to follow God in that way, there was a ceremonial cleansing that you would have to go through. Now, you would typically do this yourself and then bring yourself to to show yourself to the priest to confirm that, okay, I've done this, I've taken this step. Now, John takes that, which was basically them saying, okay, I'm a disciple of Judaism, I'm going to follow this God. John takes that and he begins to practice something called baptism, where rather than having the individual go and dunk themselves, he begins to dunk them. And so people are coming to him and saying, okay, I believe what you're saying. I'm going to repent. I'm going to change. I'm going to pursue God in this way. And John says, okay, as a symbol of that, I'm not going to ask you to go do the ceremonial washing. I'm actually going to dunk you. And Jesus takes that up and actually does the same thing for for his followers, which is why we have baptism the way that we have it. When we decide to follow Jesus, we declare our discipleship that way. And John's doing this like crazy. All these people are coming out to him and they're asking him, are you the Messiah? Listen to what it is that he says. John chapter one, it says, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. John says, listen, I'm here and I have a purpose, but the reality is, is that there's someone coming behind me. As a matter of fact, he's not in the distant future. He's actually here now. And what he's about to do is far more significant than anything that I've done. What he's going to be able to do is far more significant than anything that I've done. As a matter of fact, I'm not even worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. If you understand the significance of what he's going to do. Now, interestingly, right after John has this conversation, the next day, Jesus actually comes to see John the Baptist. Listen to what it says. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, So the next day after he's just said, No, he's here. I don't know if Jesus was actually there that day, but he says, no, he's here. He's not something in the distant future. This isn't a promise for the future. He's here. There's one who's going to do something far more significant than anything I've done. And the next day, he sees Jesus walking towards him. And immediately he stops what it is that he's doing. Just a second. I'll dunk you in just a second. And said, look. Look. Wait, wait, wait. Pop, pop, pop. Stop, 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 stop. Look. And this is the moment where John the Baptist introduces Jesus to the world. As a matter of fact, this is the moment in which this John actually leaves John the Baptist and begins to follow Jesus. Why? Because John says, wait, stop, 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 everything, stop, 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 look. And he draws everyone's attention to Jesus. And then listen to what it is that he says about him. He says, look, the Lamb of God. Now, let me pause here for a second, because what it literally means here is the Lamb God has provided he says, look, the lamb of God, at which, at which time everyone would have started looking for a sheep. Wait, I thought you were pointing to a person, but where's the sheep? I don't, now you need to understand the significance of what he's saying here because, because remember la- last week how we talked about how God, as he engages the nation of Israel after he's led them out of Egypt, how he begins to give them all these instructions of how to be able to organize themselves and govern them, each other. Well, well, as part of that, one of the instructions that he gives, and remember those instructions were not for them to earn God's relationship, but because they were in a relationship with God, they were confirmation of the relationship, not a condition of the relationship. Well, as part of those instructions, one of the things that he says is he says, I want you to trust me that I'm going to set someone who's actually going to resolve the sin issue. I I want you to trust me that I'm going to send someone who's actually going to deal with the problem that comes between you and I. And so I want for you, again, I don't need for you to, I don't need for you to clean up the mess. What do I need you to do? I need you to trust me. So here's how I want for you to practice trusting me. I want for you to consistently, and he gives them this practice of sacrificing a lamb. Well, was, was sacrificing the lamb going to actually take care of their sin? No, it's not going to erase what happened in the past any more than all the work that you're doing to try to outrun it is helping you. It's not going to actually erase it. But what it is, is it's a symbol of them trusting 
that eventually there would be one who would come who could actually do something about our past. And John says, look, the lamb that God provides, not the lamb that you provide, not, not the lambs that you guys have, not, no, not the thing that we've been practicing for the last 1,500 years. No, no. The, the one that those lambs have all been pointing to, the one that those lambs have all been referenced to, he says, look, the lamb of God, and then listen to what he says. This is Jesus' introduction moment. If there's any question of what it is that Jesus is here to do, the lamb of God who takes away, who takes away. Now, this literally means to pick up and to carry off to pick up and to carry off. This is really significant. I don't want you to forget it, so I want for you to repeat after me on the count of three, okay? I'm gonna remind you one more time because some of you don't have great memories. It means to pick up and to carry off. So I want for you to say that on the count of three, to pick up and to carry off. Ready? One, two, three. Excellent, excellent. Do you remember where the Ten Commandments are found? I won't test you on that. But (laughs) some of you are like, no, I'm going to jump on that. Again, the rules people. So look up the the Lamb of God who picks up and carries off. Well, what is it that he picks up and carries off? The sin of the world. John's introducing Jesus. He says, I want you to understand what this one is about. I want you to understand what he's here to do. From the very beginning, if, in case there's any question, I want you to understand what he's here to do. To pick up and to carry off the sin of the nation of Israel? No. Not just Jewish sin. Roman sin. Gentile sin. The sin of the world. Jesus, what are you here to do? To pick up and to carry off the sin of the world. They don't get it. None of them, even John, who's here and ends up following Jesus, he still doesn't get it. Even when Jesus talks to them about it himself later on, they, they struggle to understand what it is that he's here to do. As a matter of fact, right before he gives his life for them, they sit down for a meal. Now, this meal actually connects to what we talked about last week because this meal is the Passover meal. Remember last week we talked about how as God led them out of the nation of Egypt, he inaugurated this celebration of the fact that he had passed over them, that that he had rescued them, that he had spared them because of the fact that they had trusted him. He said, I want for you to remember how our relationship was established on that night when you trusted me. I want you to remember how I rescued you, how I, how I brought you out of slavery. So I want for you to have this meal every year and I want you to celebrate Passover and I want for you to remember me. And Jesus sits down at this meal with his disciples. It's the last meal that he has for them. So some of you have heard it called the Last Supper. And as he's sitting down at this meal, he says something that, to be honest with you, they should have been incredibly offended by. Listen listen to what he says, Luke chapter 22. It says, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them. And so they're celebrating this Passover meal and they're remembering what God had done. And he takes this bread and he breaks it and he gives it to them. And then he says this to them. He says, do this. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of, in remembrance of what? In remembrance of what God did to lead us out of Egypt. In remembrance of Passover and the rescue that God executed on that day. No, no, no. He steps in and says, no, from now on, I want you to do this. Not in remembrance of what happened then. Not in remembrance of how Israel's relationship with God was solidified as they trusted him on that Passover night. Not not to remember that rescue. He says, from now on, I want for you to do this and remember me. What? You you want for us to remember you at Passover now? Do you know how offensive this would be? It would be like you going to your friends and saying, hey, this Christmas, I think you should really celebrate me. 
I think from now on Christmas should be about me. No, 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 no. You don't get to just hijack Christmas. Jesus, what are you? Wait, 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 wait. And this is phenomenally offensive. He says, no, 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 from now on, from now on you're going to remember me. And then he continues, he says, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. And then he continues and he says the very same thing. He says, I want you to do this in remembrance of what? In remembrance of me. He says, I'm about to do something new. And I've been talking to you guys about this. And John the Baptist, when he, remember when he introduced me and talked about what it was that I'm here to do? I'm about to establish a new covenant. And I know that you used to, you used to have this meal to remember the old covenant. And you used to, you used to have this meal to remember the, the relationship that was made possible because of what happened on Passover and the way that you trusted God and the way that God rescued you and the rescue that was, that was delivered on that day. He says, but now I'm about to do something new. There's going to be, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, there's going to be a new rescue. There's going to be a new relationship that I'm going to make possible with my blood. Because you see, I am the Lamb of God sent to take away the sin of the world. They still didn't get it. They still didn't get it. In several hours, Jesus gave his life on the cross. But there's an interesting thing that's captured by the writers of scripture when it tells the story of Jesus' death. I think many of us miss it. Do you know how people usually died when they're crucified? They suffocate. Because as you're put on a cross in order for you to breathe with the way that you're situated, you have to pull yourself up in order to get air to come into your lungs. But remember, your hands and feet are nailed to this cross. So every time that you pick yourself up, it's excruciating. And so as you get weaker and weaker, you just settle in and your lungs begin to fill with fluid and you you suffocate to death. And what typically would happen is that the guards would would wait until they felt that the that the individuals had been tortured enough, or maybe the guards were ready to go home, and they would come and they would break their legs so that they could no longer pick themselves up, so that they would suffocate faster. And when Jesus was crucified with the two others who were crucified with him, when they came to break their legs, the two who were crucified with him were still alive and their legs were broken so that they would suffocate. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. Because you see, he had bled to death. From the beatings, from the crown of thorns, from his mutilated back as it scratched against the cross. He had bled to death. Jesus says, I'm gonna do something new. It's no longer that rescue that you're going to remember. It's another rescue. It's a new relationship. And I'm gonna make it possible with my blood. 
the blood that I will shed for you. The writer Paul captures it this way as he's trying to help us understand the significance of all that Jesus came to do and what it is that he accomplished as he bled to death on that cross. We find it in Colossians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. It says this, He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. See, the reality is, is that we all understand that we owe. It's not just that we owe them. It's not just that we owe ourselves. We all understand that we owe God and the reality of what we were created to be and who we were created to be and the life that we were created to live and how we've fallen short of that. We understand that we all owe. And we also understand, and this is an interesting thing because it, as you walk through this, it doesn't talk about God condemning us. What is it that condemns us? It's our sin. He forgave our sins, which stood and condemned us. And all of us have experienced that. That's what we experience when it gets quiet in life. And all of a sudden that weekend comes back and it stands and accuses us. And we're crushed by it. Because it condemns us. And we know the debt that is owed. But Jesus steps in and says, no, 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 I've canceled the debt. I've forgiven you because I've canceled the debt. Well, how do you just cancel the debt which stood against us and condemned us? He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. He has done what? He has picked it up and carried it off. He has picked it up and carried it off, nailing it to the cross. How do you cancel the debt? How do you wash away my sin? What is it? Is there anything that can wash away my sin? Jesus says yes. But there's only one thing. You see, the sacrifice of those lambs, it could do nothing to actually wash away your sin. The good things you do in your future, the, how much you give, it, it could do nothing to wash away your sin. But there is one thing. The blood of Jesus. And I'm going to pay the debt that you owe. How are you going to pay that debt? With my blood. And I'm going to give my life for you. And I'm going to pick up your sin. And I'm going to carry it off. I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to carry it off. Nailing it to the cross. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You don't have to forgive yourself because, this is so important, because yourself has already been forgiven. Listen to me. You don't have to forgive yourself Yourself has already been forgiven. Whose sin did he come to carry away? Did he, did he come to pick up and to carry off? The sin of the world from the beginning, from the moment that he was introduced. Here is the Lamb of God who's come to do what? To pick it up and to carry it off. There's a new rescue that I want for you to remember. You don't have to forgive yourself. Yourself has already been forgiven. You just have to receive it. I don't need you to clean up the mess. I just need you to trust me. 
I don't need you to keep the rules. I, 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 I need you to trust me. I don't need you to pay for what happened that weekend. I don't need you to pay for those words you wish you could take back. I don't need you to pay for the fact that you know you should have stood up, that somebody should have stood up for him, but you didn't. I don't need you to pay for that. I just need you to trust me. And Jesus steps in our story and says, if you'll receive it, if you'll trust me, I'll pick it up and I'll carry it off. I've already paid the price. I've already paid the debt. If you'll receive it. And I know some of you say, well, but, but, but what about, I mean, what about that feeling? I st- what, what, what about that feeling of guilt when I remember what happened? Or or when I'm reminded of that mistake? What, what, what do I do with, with that? And here's one of the most amazing things that Jesus makes possible in our life. Because you see, when you understand that Jesus picked it up and and carried it off, when you understand that with his blood that he paid for what happened, that the debt is paid, all of a sudden those moments that currently bring guilt and shame can can be transformed and, and, and them no longer, as you recall that moment, for them to no longer bring that guilt and shame, but instead to be memorials. In other words, to be constant reminders of God's grace and love. So that as you think back to it, it's no longer something that crushes you, but it's something that lifts you because you know that the blood of Jesus paid for what happened in that moment. And that Jesus picked that up and he carried it off. He nailed it to that cross. And this is something that you're gonna have to practice because your flesh wants you to just sit in that guilt. It wants that memory to be something that brings shame. But the reality is, is this. Listen to me, listen to me very carefully. For those who step into a relationship with Jesus, there is nothing in the rearview mirror but a giant cross. And you can look back all you want. But what you see there has been paid for by him. The question is, will you receive it? Will you bow your head? For some of you, this this may be the first time that you've ever had this conversation with God. But I want to invite you right now to do what Jesus has invited you to do. To trust him. Not that there's a system that can free you from your past. Not that there's a system where you can pay for your past. But to trust him. That he paid for your past. To trust him. That he was the Lamb of God, sent to pick up and carry off the sin of the world, including yours. I want to invite you right now to go to him and engage him in that conversation to say, Jesus, God, I need to be forgiven. I understand I'm not just a mistake. I understand that I can't pay for it. 
but I trust you. I trust you that you can pick it up and you can carry it off. That you can transform that moment from something that brings shame to something that inspires worship. To a constant reminder of your love and grace. I trust you. For others of you, this this may be a conversation that you had with him long ago. But you need to remind yourself today and engage him again today with the reality. You don't have to carry that anymore. I want to invite you to celebrate with him today the reality that it is gone, that the debt has been canceled, that you've been forgiven, that the past is paid for. Father, What phenomenal grace. What phenomenal grace. In Jesus' name, amen.